Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Welcome back again to the 2020 Card and Board Game Online Summit. We've been having a great time all week. I appreciate all of you guys who've been looking at the videos and sending emails and comments. But listen, tonight is an exciting night. I've been waiting for this night all week. I have a great man that's on the call with us today. He's a friend. I met him at one of the homeschooling conventions. Uh, I've seen his work, seen his game. He is doing some incredible things. As a matter of fact, I'm going to let you let him tell it to you. But you know, if I if I would have had history taught to me the way this man has created, invented, and innovated the way history is taught, I would probably like it. <laughs> I hated it as a kid because there was nothing like this. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to please welcome you to meeting my friend, Mr. Zach Edwards. How are you, Zach? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on here. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So while we have you on here, I would love to get, get started with you. Uh, first of all, would you let people know a little bit about yourself and your incredible game that you have invented? It's a little different than anything I've seen. Oh yeah, so Elliot, actually I came from the same point of view. I hated, I hated history when I came out of high school. My, it was my teacher, well okay, teachers are great. Let me, not, let me start there, teachers are great, but sometimes it's book studies, it's lectures and it's uh, tests and it's just like boring and so, they didn't go down to the essence of history. They didn't go to the individuals. They didn't go to making it fun and enjoyable to read. So when I left high school, I went off to college and there, I had an English assignment that was to create a product that would change the world. So I said, okay, what can I do? Right now, I hated history, but I love games. And I knew that 90, like 98% of, of kids love games, but like probably 95%, and that's the stat I don't have, 95% probably don't like history. And so I knew that there had to be some way of creating something that would make them excited for it. So I merged the two. Now I played games like Magic the Gathering. Uh, I played games like Risk. And so I took a game, or I took history, and I made it into almost like Magic the Gathering, where you can actually, they're all historically based people. You have the history here, and the abilities for the game are right there. So and this actually started off like a baseball card and nobody liked it. So I got rid of that idea, came up with this. And now it's actually played like the game of risk. So if you know risk, you'll be able to pick this up right away. It's basically world domination where you're trying to take all your opponent's land from them. So that's a little bit of uh, the game and how that started. I've actually been doing this for about, let's see, my college years were actually about 17 years ago. Man, I'm old. <laughs> started 17 years ago and then it also and then uh so i brought it out and the history channel actually came up with their own game it was called anachronism now it was so poorly made and they burned every bridge thinking that they were the greatest inventor in the world and so the everyone from retailers to distributors hated working with them because the history channel had this big ego but when I brought my game out and they brought their game out, I had nothing behind me. They had millions of dollars behind them, behind me. So the distributor said, well, we're going with that game. So I said, that's fine. Because my wife actually told me, you know what? Put away the game, go get a real job. <laughs> so that's what I did. I got a real job and I did that for about 10 years. But then there was kids that wanted to, to see what I had. I was teaching about entrepreneurism. Like you and I and a lot of these people on here, we love making our own games. We love making our own businesses. And so um, I showed them what I had. And they wanted more. And so I had to get partners. I had to get funding. And that's when it took off. As of right now, we sold over 30,000 copies. Um, wow. We've been on this for seven years. And we're in all 50 states. And I think it was like seven countries, including South Korea, Australia, uh, UK is easy, Canada is semi-easy, um, and then um, a few others. I think Greece was also one. So. That's absolutely amazing that, that you can do that with history. So tell, tell me a little bit about some of, the, uh, some of the characters or figures. As a matter of fact, the game is called Historical Conquest. Yes. Uh, the website is historicalconquest.com. So I'm going to put that in the, uh, in the chat bar. Make sure you guys go see it. So tell us a little bit about some of the, some of the people that you have on the cards and, and maybe a little bit about that so people can get an idea of what we're talking about when we say history and the characters in history. 
Oh yeah. So uh, everyone knows George Washington. Like if you Google him, I just did this a little while ago, you'll get 1.24 billion websites that will show George Washington. So there's all this information out there. So we made a card for him. And so youth can actually, or players, sorry, I shouldn't even say just youth, but players can actually read all about them. Uh, ones that I love telling. Okay, so there is actually a guy by the name of Thomas Crapper. C-R-A-P-P-E-R. -P -P -E Thomas Crapper, he did not create the toilet, but he promoted <laughs> it. He was the one that put it in the Royals, uh, the Royals mansion or a residence, and then everybody wanted it. It's like the, the Queen of England wanted it, that everybody wanted it type of thing. Well, is that where the term the crapper came from? That's exactly where it wow. came from. <laughs> I never would have known that. Yeah, so I really feel sorry for the guy, but at the same time, I mean, yeah, <laughs> sure. That's incredible. Now, you know, one of the things that I think is so innovative about yours, so you have a lot of people who try to create board games, and you have a lot of people who try to create card games. But somehow you were able to find a way to mix the two because you have the card game, which is very, very, very vast, but you also have a board that goes along with it. How did, how did you, what made you decide to merge the two? Well, okay, so with card games, everybody loves, uh, well, the people in my sphere loved card games. I mean, it was the, the newest thing at the time. And so when I wanted to get some information about history in there, I, all, I had to get something that they could actually see. Uh, let me say it another way. Uh, the game of risk. You're playing with nameless, faceless figures on a board. You can't learn anything from it. Now, my ob objection, objective was to actually make um, learning history fun. So I had to give them some sort of information. And then that small space, there's not much space to give all the information on. But so I, I took that. And then some people were asking me, so what's the layout? How do I lay it out? I said, this is easy. So I explained it to them. They're like, you know, what'd be really cool is if you got a mat, if you got a board that you put out and it shows where the, the rectangles are, where all the cards are placed and such, but that would be really nice. And I said, Hey, that's a perfect idea. So funny enough, this is for all the designers out there. I went online. I grabbed a regular image of the world map and I put it through a filter that distorted it. It basically made it so that it's like flames going through it. I used that as, my first mat and it's actually my top selling mat seven years running wow wow just something so simple and i got it off the internet but because it was store distorted there's no copyright in there's nothing like that <laughs> and it's my again everyone loves it so well it's not true some people say it hurts the eyes but whatever see and i think that's what's so amazing when you when you do things like that because you come up with new ways to invent things so that you can continue on with your project. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's amazing. So for all of those people that are out there, um, don't, you don't necessarily have to be afraid when it comes down to try, coming up with ideas for a board or something like that. You can use things. I like, I used to call it, uh, I used to, at one time I used to call it still and my wife told me, no, 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 it's benchmarking. So you can benchmark a lot of different things, put it into play and see how that develops you along the way. So here's a question. Yeah. One, one thing. So I actually learned about um, one of the great things with designing games. This is number one rule that you always want to do. And this is what was told to me, whether it's true or not, I, I've gained from it. But you always want to create a game that has some sort of comfort level. So you have like a game like your game. And it feels somewhat like the game of life. We're moving around the tracks. And so people feel comfortable with the game of life and you say, okay, it's like the game of life, or I don't know what you compare it to exactly. I, I know you've probably told me that before, but, um, but if you compare it to something that they already know, it makes them say, oh, I could do that. I know that. So when I compare it, I compare it to game of risk. Most people know the game of risk. And so it, in their mind, they're like, oh, there's a comfort level. So when you create a game, if you have that comfort level, it doesn't matter how close it is, but if they know or feel that there's a, a comfort level there, they're more likely to buy it because they can relate it to something. You know, that's interesting because that's, that's, that's what I did in the beginning when I came out with the game, but I didn't realize that's what I was doing. So uh -huh. someone would ask me, well, tell me about the game. And I would say, well, it's like a combination of Monopoly. If you took Monopoly and the game of life, smushed it together, but did it from an entrepreneurship view, yeah. this is what you would get. 
and which yeah. was good because those were my two favorite games, and that that kind of had a little bit of uh, influence on me when I was creating the actual game. Yeah, and I've already told you this before, but that's why my kids like it. They have a comfort level of knowing those two games, and then they have the, the twist of the entrepreneurism. So yeah. my, my son actually uh, loves ransacking his, uh, his uh, siblings <laughs> with that. So it's like, yeah. <laughs> that is great. That is great. So let me ask you this. So we've talked about, so far this week, we've talked to inventors, we've talked about games, and like I said, I think yours is one of the most amazing games. And it's so, it's so vast you're able to add on continuously, I guess, because there's so many people in history. Oh, yeah. You just continue. How, do, so how do you, how, what is the process that you, when you're ready to expand your game, because you have a card game, it is a board as well. When you go to the process of trying to expand it, how, how does that work for you? How do you? How do you decide what to do? So there's multiple ways of doing it. Uh, we have basically, we can pick an era in time, and then my historian will give us like 20 different subjects subjects to, to write about, so 20 different cards for that one pack. But something new that we've done is we've actually made it so that we have a contest at the end of the year, and this gets hundreds of entries every year where uh, one of the players comes in and they give us basically the name, the history, and the abilities the card should have of somebody from history. And now we just go through that list and we say, okay, let's pick this person, this person, this person, and that's when we created a, a randomized deck are randomized decks. So there's two things that happen in that, that point of view. So one, the, pers the, uh, the list, we don't have to go searching out for all these different people. The list is right there that we can choose from. But number two that's great is the person that produces it, that gave us that entry, feels ownership in that deck of cards. And so they wanna buy that deck of cards. And then they want their friends to buy that deck of cards. It's like, that one's the best because my card's in there. <laughs> yeah. And that's amazing to be able to bring people into it and, and, and give them a feeling like they were part of the whole process. They're part of the game. That's amazing because not a lot of game makers are able to do that with what they have. Yeah. Um, now, you do something a little, a little special with your game, too. You have, uh, you have online sessions with people all over the United States where they could come together and play. How, how does that work? So... Again, we've been doing this for, for seven years, and we've done this mass list of emails, or an email list together. Um, when coronavirus actually started happening, um, a, lot of these, a lot of these players couldn't go to their local tournaments. Let me, let me back up a little bit. So uh, we wanted to get some way for youth and players to be able to play against other players. And unless you have connections, there's no way of doing that. You have to have connections on all these different parts. Now, homeschoolers have a good connection in their co-ops and such. But if you're not, there's no real way of finding out where these games are even played, especially when they just are starting up. So we went around and we introduced this to families and to parents and said, hey, you can become an ambassador. And it started off, um, they, they got really excited about being able to bring it to their co-op, bring it to other um, players in the area so their kids could play it. And so those parents basically started doing this for free because they wanted more people for their kids to play with. So one thing, they didn't have to play with their kids all the time at home. Um, but also by doing this, we started spreading out and now it's in, I think like 40, 40 something states. Um, we have over a hundred games going on every month um, in all these different places. And now the ambassadors can actually contact, if we have a new person that says, can I play a game? We say, yeah, contact this ambassador. And if there's no one in the area, we say, hey, if you want, you can become an ambassador. And we give them incentives like discounts. And uh, we have a marketplace that's just for them with a discounted rate so they could sell their own inventory. Um, we also have every month, there's an, um, a new rare card coming from the rare card contest that I mentioned before. Yeah. The one thing I didn't mention is that the top 12 cards actually get um, their cards made and the number one card gets $500. Ooh, that's nice. Yeah. So every player wants to do that. So that all they're doing is entering all these people from history, but those 12 cards every month, because there's 12 months, every month there's a new card that goes out. And so all of a sudden they really want those rare cards because they're not sold in boxes. They're only given out at these, at these tournaments. And so now they go to the tournaments. Now, because of coronavirus, we all of a sudden had to turn all those local games into virtual games. And so we'll start up. And we have, we have 100 and something kids that come every week 
to play the game. And so we put them in their own rooms, their own separate game rooms, and uh, are able to um, keep them entertained. Now, we can't get them rare cards because we're not there in person. Mm -hmm. So what I've told them is, okay, if you want the rare card, buy anything from the, the marketplace, buy anything from us, and we'll send you that rare card in the mail with it. And we even uh, sweetened the deal a little bit right now. We've actually given uh, February, March, and April. And that's taken off in sales. All those people that were playing one had that rare card that they couldn't get anywhere else. So yeah, there's a lot of different things. Wow. So I want to mention two things to people that are watching. So we, we <laughs> and I have to say it this way, we have a brilliant mind on a, with us today. First of all, he found a way to make history cool and fun and entertaining, right? And he found a way to get people interested and connected all over the place to want to play a game that's history based. I mean, this is I mean, this is not a video game. These are this is an actual card game that people can that are joining in from over 40 states. You see that? So, number 1, if you can do that, that's that's incredible. But what I'm what I'm loving hearing right now, and this is for all the people who are who want to create board games, listen to the process that he's going through when he's telling you how he's built his business, you know, the different creative ideas that he's done had, that he's done to create a rapport with with one with his customers and potential customers but also how to get them invested in the game how to get them invested in the product how to bring them on board and how to expand it between their friends because they want their friends to come on this is just amazing the way you've done that and the way you've built this empire thank you i know you're saying it's small um it's, it's a large empire but just the potential only after seven years i think that's amazing I think that's amazing. Thank you. Well, and one thing when it comes to <clears throat> making games, um, I was at one of the uh, conventions for game making, just for game making. And they said, if you can sell 2,000 copies, you're doing really well. Because you have to think about it. There are, I think there's, I think the statistics are like 3,000 games are created every year around the world. Game shops only have an inventory of about 100 games. So where do those other games go? Well, some of them go out, go out of business. Some of them um, do other things like because of, uh, let's see, Kickstarter. A lot of people, they just throw their stuff on Kickstarter and then they sell on their website. They don't even go to the stores anymore. So a lot of people that want new games, they go on Kickstarter, they get their, their games that they want. Now that's a whole nother process. I mean, we can go on hours for that one. But uh, yeah, there's different avenues to getting out your games. Now I decided because the distributors wanted like uh, anachronism, the history channel game, I decided that I would not put all my focus on distributors. I have retailers that, that contact me individually, but I focused right now on the homeschooling group because it was learning the homeschoolers. Well, that took off um, almost all the conventions I've, well, okay, all the large conventions I've been to and people know me there. So I can go to any one of them and find friends and and such, but also I'm starting to branch off into the public schools. So with creating a game, if you can find a niche, the greatest niche for your product, and again, um, don't do a niche just because somebody else has it. Find a niche that focuses on the game that you wanna create, and all of a sudden, everyone that's in that niche will wanna get that, that game. But if you focus on getting everybody you're not going to be able to please anybody. Absolutely. I think that's great advice. I hope you guys have heard that. And we talked a little bit about that, um, knowing who your market is, knowing exactly who your market is so you can go to them and not just waste your time and money with everybody around. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought that up. So here's a question that, <clears throat> that I haven't asked anyone else that I really like you to speak on. So you, you came up with this great game, great idea. You came up with the plan to do it. So you went from, effectively, you went from being an inventor to turning into a businessman. You still keep the, te the, uh, the hat of inventor on there and creator and creativity. But how is that transition? Once you, as a board game creator or as a card game creator, after you created it, how hard was it for you to learn how to now become the businessman in the face of the product that you wanted to get out to the world? So my love has always been the business. Um, I love doing business. Uh, the product, I hated history when I started it. Now I love it, but I, I did. So um, it was interesting. I love making games though. Games is 
I created a, a game course for, for people to, to join and be able to do things or to learn how to make games. And I go through all the different steps because I'm, that's something I love doing. I have a, passionate for, a passion for. But the, the problem is that if you create a game and you have, and you're going to spend any money on, money on it, you're going to learn, have to learn how to do the business. And so I started doing that. Now, my issue, the reason why it's not, and again, I say this with some um, hesitation, the reason why it, it's staying small and it's not getting bigger is because I'm not a big, uh, I'm not the best at dele delegating my, my work, my efforts. They say that 80% of the money that you make is off 20% of your effort. And that's usually you want to give the rest of your effort to somebody else to do. And so this year I was like, perfect. That's what exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to give all my stuff that I don't want to do, or it doesn't make much money to somebody else and delegate the process. And again, it's part of the learning the business. But the sad thing was all of a sudden the coronavirus happened. I didn't go to the conventions that I was going to go to. I'm stuck at home. And so I was like, what do you do? So I couldn't hire on the people I wanted to, but that's still the plan. I'm still working on doing that. So there's a lots of ups and downs. And my, my brother went through, um, got his MBA. And while I was going through his MBA, he said, and you really need to go back to college and get your MBA. I was like, why? He's like, oh, so you can learn all these things. I was like, tell me something I need to learn. He's like, okay, you need to learn this. Okay, I've learned that and I've done better than that to some extent. Okay, you need to learn this. I said, okay, great. I don't know about that. I'd rather hire somebody else to do that. And so, yes, you can go to school for, get your MBA, learn the business, or you can learn through hard knocks, which is one of the best schools you'll ever go to. I can't go back to school. I've got kids, I've got family, can't do it. I mean, I could do, well, okay. You guys might not know this, but Elliot knows this. I am always busy and that's not a good thing. <laughs> I'm trying not to be as busy as I am, but I always have things going on, especially as an inventor, love creating things, not just games, but a ton of different things. And so having the creative mind, I would so love to put somebody else in charge of the whole business and do it and do the, all the creating for the, our company. But I have to have wear both hats. As soon as I can though, I'm going to dump all that stuff on somebody else so I can do the fun stuff like creating games. But the great thing is that if you're going to do that, you're going to learn everything that they know so that when you hire someone to do all those things that you just learned, they're going to be able to do it and do it so much better because they're going to work with you and you're going to know what they're talking about when they're doing it. So you want to be educated on doing business. I'm sorry. That's a really round way of, of answering your question, but it, there's a lot, a lot of ends and ends on that question. There's so many different things that come from that. Yeah, I think that's great information. Uh, I think you do need to know. So when I was younger, they used to tell me that <clears throat> if you're going to own the company, you really need to know it from the ground up. So that way, even if you do give it to, give a portion of it to somebody else, you know what they're supposed to be doing. You can talk to them about it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you can give them ideas and you can work with them. And that's where the two heads be, are better than one comes in. So I think that's a great, great point that you brought up. Yeah. So now I had a question asked to me last night uh, when I was doing the presentation that I'd like to put to you. Just because you mentioned the, uh, the plans that you had and then all of a sudden the coronavirus hit. So you had these plans on how you were going to expand your company this year. Then all of a sudden you're in the midst of a coronavirus that came out of nowhere and shut down the whole world, which stopped all of your plans. How do you find, how do you find your way through that? How do you step back and, and figure out how to uh, adjust to it? Because lots of businesses are shutting their doors forever. Yep. How does that not affect you? How do you can find a way to continue on? Okay, so to bring this uh, together, I want to say, Jessica, your comment last was great. Yeah, building a team is a lifesaver. Uh, so I do have a team behind me. I actually have partners behind me. Um, and so we actually basically had to go back to the drawing table and figure out what to do with the coronavirus. Uh, that's when we turned the, the local tournaments into virtual tournaments. Um, when we took our marketing, instead of going to conventions, we started doing marketing online. Um, the coronavirus, it can be a disaster for a business, or it can be the greatest learning uh, opportunity 
that you'll ever have. And I was just talking to some friends about this yesterday. So we have the conventions. It's always been our number one uh, moneymaker every year. We go to 20 something conventions and we bank on all of them. Now we could do that, but with the coronavirus, we ended up not being able to do that. So we started doing marketing online a little bit more than we were doing before. But here's the thing, all of a sudden next year, no coronavirus, hopefully, no coronavirus. Then we have our conventions that we, we've always banked at and also online sales. Now we have two different things that we're the best at because we focused on the online sales this year. Then we were able to merge them. So we can look at it in disasters. We can close up shop or we can go through the hard knocks and find ways to getting through. I actually took a pay cut. Actually, I took a paper cut a little bit before that um, because I brought in a writer who's now writing all my um, information for a website that we created on the side. It's like an encyclopedia, almost like the History Channel, but so much cooler. It's like the, we call it the most interactive history site you'll ever see. It's called huntthepast.com. And that one website is now informing people that when they're playing a card, say that they want to get more information. Well, they go on that, that website. Yep, exactly. They go on that website and they can get, learn more information. There's videos, any type of learning style that you like is on there. So you can get summaries, you can get books, you can get uh, videos, activities, all these different things. And so one of the things we do, um, we did with the coronavirus, instead of laying off all our people, we, we did reduce them, their hours and such. We took my pay completely out. I'm fine for now, for now. Hopefully it doesn't continue for that much longer. Um, but we were able to give them other tasks as well. So he might be a writer for this part of my company, but I want, to write, I want him to do things over here as well. We basically um, maneuvered our people around. Um, also, as part of our team, we also have ambassador coordinators. The coordinators are the people that watch over the tournaments, the local tournaments. I can't talk to all of our ambassadors, our 100 ambassadors around the US. That's why I gave two stay-at-home moms that have been doing homeschooling for a long time, because again, that's our number one niche. And they take care of all of the games that go on throughout the, the, the country. If they have questions, they come to me, they ask me the question, then they go back to the people. And right now, they probably know more about the tournaments than I do, which, I mean, I guess I taught them right, if that's the case. Yeah, that's what you want. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> that's a great idea. So now we have one, uh, we actually have a homeschool family that's with us this evening. Uh, they haven't said anything this evening. I, I'm sure they're soaking up the information. Um, so one of the things I wanted to ask you about, so is I need to go into manufacturing just a little bit because you have a different perspective than I do. Now I have my games manufacturer here in, in the US um, and you've chosen to go a little bit of a different way. Can you talk about that and why, why you came to that decision and how that works for you? Oh yeah. Okay. So when we started, we actually started in, um, I think our printer was in Utah and he was printing. We then went to a, a printer in Florida. Um, then when we started getting to large numbers, thousands of uh, prints, um, with each shipment, all of a sudden they were telling us that they were actually printing in China. So they were basically the middleman. And I was like, no, that doesn't make sense. I'm not going to pay you to be the middleman. I can do that myself. And so, the, now the coronavirus has made a lot of people think about manufacturing in China. Um, especially, I have one deck of cards that's been out of, out of publishing for about four months. And that's because China shut down. All of a sudden I had nobody to print them. And I said, you know, I'm gonna make this an opportunity. Um, so I did, I made an opportunity. I won't go into that yet, but with the manufacturing, um, when I got to large enough numbers, I basically had to find my own people over in uh, China. And Elliot, I'd be, I'd be great uh, to share my printers with you. They're called Honest Vintage. Um, they're over in China. Best customer service I've ever seen. With all of my people that I've used over in China, they're the best ones out there. Um, but in order to find the producer, the manufacturer for you that's the best, you really have to do a lot of testing. Um, and a lot of that starts off at, uh, um, there's a website called Alibaba.com. If you want to go to China and have them print for you, you're going to have to print in larger masses. 
So wait until your game gets going. Now, Alibaba is basically a, a website that gives you all the manufacturers in China, um, some from other places, but mostly in China. It's basically like your Amazon of China. It gives you all these different products, um, not just games, but anything you can imagine that China makes, it's usually on that site. And so if you want to do a, a different type of razor blade, they would have someone there to produce it. If you want to do a different kind of game, they'd have someone there that could produce it. And so I could actually work with them to create a new concept of a game. Um, they might have like, they're just printers of cardboard. Well, okay, can you do cutout cardboard? You know, when the, if you've seen them, the, the ships that they can, uh, you can pop them out and put them together for the games. Mm -hmm. Those are all made in China. You can make them all in China. Now, one big thing, and this is from my competitors. Um, when I was printing in the United States, I was printing for five or $6 per deck. Going to China, it goes back down to about $2 per deck. But people that go into mass producing, like uh, Yu-Gi-Oh, Pokemon, Magic, they're getting for like 25 cents per deck. Yeah, so they're, I mean, uh, what is it? They're, uh, the amount of money that they make, their percentage of return on each deck is amazing. But they have to get into those large decks. So, yeah, I do have a little bit different uh, concept going into China. But uh, if you do go to China, make sure you have a U.S. printer as well. And then also watch for when you're picking out a printer that they can duplicate your prints. I have one printer in the United States. I have one printer here. Now, they don't do exactly the same. The printer here in the United States, I still use for individual cards. But their, their color scheme is a tiny bit off. Because they're a larger printer, though, they will not um, modify their colors to match my existing cards. So that's a little bit of an issue as well. But uh, my players have adjusted. And now my printer in China is starting to do individual cards as well. So I really want to keep them here in the United States. I have to have the pigment exact same. Or it just doesn't work. Okay, so how, how have you found, so we had a, uh, on Tuesday, we had someone, a manufacturer from China who came in to speak with us uh, from Boda Games. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things that we talked about was the shipping, because I have a friend who, who got their stuff from China, and she got a great price on it, but when she got, went to go pick it up, she found out that they didn't tell her about shipping, and that added a couple of thousands of dollars she wasn't prepared to pay. Uh, so how, how have you found shipping to be? Do they normally, do you normally get that included or have there been any issues? What type of things do you need to look out for? They'll almost never include it in the price of the product. Um, they'll always give it as a separate. I have actually found that we ship everything by air from China. One, you're going to get it faster. Um, two, you don't have to pay as many customs fees because if they go through FedEx, uh, DHL, or um, UPS, they don't have those, those fees in there. Or they have some of them, but not all those fees. Like my $1,000 I would have paid for a shipment is more like $50 to $100 through FedEx. That's the kind of difference. Yeah. Okay. So, but it's, at the same time, if you're shipping by air, you're still going to pay more by, by price. But if you, if you divide that out between all the cards that you have, or all the, the games or all the whatever, it really starts to be small amounts of money, like three cents, uh, even 50 cents, depending on the price of the, the product or, or such. So it's not that much to make it uh, to really want to go through a cargo ship. Now, as you get bigger, you're probably going to want to go through a cargo ship because then it's going to get really expensive. I had one, um, I think it doubled the price of the product when they shipped it here. And that uh, I wasn't too happy with, but I needed it really fast. So I did it. And I got my shipment. It was like 40 very large boxes of, of games, actually my son's game. And um, it arrived. Everything was great, except it costs me uh, an arm and a leg. One other thing from China. Now, this is backtracking a little bit. But when you go to China, never accept their first price. Their culture is set for negotiations. It's like Mexico. It's like India. They want to negotiate, though at the same time, they're not going to tell you they want to negotiate. They want to negotiate because they want your business. So every time I go in to Alibaba or to any of these sites, 
I'll say, okay, I want this. These are the, uh, the stats on it, the um, specifics on it. What, can, what price are you going to give me? So they're going to be a price. I'm going to get five of them. Then I'm going to go back or five to 10 of them. And then I'm going to go back to the, the first person and say, okay, this person gave me this price. Can you beat that? And they'll almost always try to beat it. Not to say they can, but they will try to beat it. They'll even drop their price to the amount that they can and say, okay, this is the best price we can get. Well, sorry, it's not going to work out and go back to the one that's the lowest price. Again, you might have problems with quality. So you can always ask them for samples. Most of the times though, if they're gonna ship you, if they're gonna ship you something for samples, it's gonna cost you. So okay. yeah, like my last one for my play mats, they've always been made in LA. Well, my LA printer, because of coronavirus, has really done poorly. And it's not his fault, it's coronavirus. Plus, he's also charged me like two and a half times what I would be paying from China, inclu uh, including shipping. So I said, okay, I need to go in. So I went in, I asked, I think 20, uh, 10 different people at least. And I said, what price can you give me? Now, all of them gave me just over $2. I said, the only way I can do this is if you can get under $2. But I knew where they were all set at. They were all set at right above $2 or more. And I said, okay, I need to have it under this benchmark. Can you do that? And I found two people that could. They shipped me their, their samples. It cost me like $34 to ship a, a sample out here, which probably did not cost them that much to do it, but I'm, I'm okay with it because it's a sample. And I'm getting the $2. I've just um, put in an, off, uh, a, a, uh, um, an invoice for their product, and I hope that it's going to turn out. The sample looks great. Now I'm trusting them that when they send me this first shipment, it's going to be great as well. Wow. So Alibaba can be your friend. <clears throat> yes. It can also be your enemy. Okay. So you always, yeah, you always want to check on the, not Alibaba itself, but the, the people that are on there. Mm -hmm. You always want to check the reviews. And don't just check for um, reviews that anybody could write. Usually I skip the five stars and I skip the one stars. I go in the between because that's going to be the real people. A lot of people are going to say, okay, I like this, pro this manufacturer, but these are the issues. Mm -hmm. like, well, can I get over that, those issues? Yeah. So I use that person. Don't be afraid to use, um, oh, and I'll talk about Terraforce. That's also really interesting if you're interested in that, yeah. um, just comments. But uh, you want to make sure that you get the, the best price for all your products. So again, best price, best quality. And a lot of times that has to do with um, getting samples. Okay, uh, Terraforce really fast. Um, right now, they have not really affected the gaming industry that much. They have actually held off um, before Christmas. They held off on all Terraforce going on, anything toys or game related. They're supposed to put the, the tariffs back on there. Um, they are for some things. Uh, some things they've been taken off. Um, the last time I checked, last time I had something uh, shipped, they did not have a problem with um, the tariffs coming in. So games is a, is a fairly safe industry to be in. Um, it's not, I don't know, to a lot of people in DC, I don't think it's considered professional and things like iPhones, those have tariffs or cars, those have tariffs. But when it comes to games, it's like, eh, no, I'll just let them go. It's like, thank you. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> so I have actually a friend that does uh, all the, um, he's a lawyer, a business lawyer, a corporate lawyer for basically China, between China and here. And so he gives me all these stats that are going on. He's like, games are safe right now. Not saying it will happen or continue, especially during the coronavirus. Uh, I think it's free game right now. <laughs> For, for printing. Um, but yeah, tariffs have not really played much of a, an effect. Plus, again, I went through FedEx instead of sending it through cargo. There might have been some things that uh, I didn't know, I didn't experience because I went through air. Because again, there's less of that bureaucracy going through air. I don't have to use an, export, an exporter. Um, I have one on hand. And I can call them up anytime. I got a personal cell phone. I can call them up anytime. But as soon as I started going through air, I haven't needed him. Which he keeps calling me. He's giving me presents and keeping me in his mind. In, in mind. But yeah, 
Okay, okay. Now, <clears throat> when I when I first met you, um, you gave me some information or advice about a game, about what I could do. Now, so far we've got we've talked about getting the game together, the creativity part, the business part, the uh, manufacturing. So now you have this game made. You're a new game inventor, or you're a game, <clears throat> or early into the into your career, and you need to get your game out there. But you kind of need some sort of vouching system, some sort of help. Now, when I talk with you, you gave me some great ideas about how to get go back and get backings uh, via awards. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about how important that might be for a uh, game maker that's entering into the into the uh, industry? So again, I, I always start off with what we already talked about: find your niche, find the people that really want to be in your game. And again, word of mouth is number one. It should always be number one on your mind because you have to find out how to get people to, to talk about it. Um, and one of the things that I think we were talking about also was starting up tournaments or gatherings where like-minded people get together and talk about it. Um, for example, a business game, an entrepreneur game, I think this is one thing that we were talking about, is if I wanted to get some people together, the parents, you got entrepreneurs, you've got meetups, you've got all these different things. They don't have anything for kids. There's like nothing for kids. And so all of a sudden you want to put together a, a meetup for, for kids to get together, even virtually, and you'll have people coming in at different rates. Um, you need to have some sort of network, way of getting to that niche to get your information out. Now, I just entered into um, California does homeschooling and they actually pay for it. Um, Alaska does the same thing, but I was living up there at the time. So California, totally brand new thing. I did not know how to get into getting these people interested. And so I've actually offered to go over there and set up games for them to start up. So I fly over there, I'd set them up. Um, so let me go back to your question. You were saying rewards, which, uh, what did you mean by a reward, or rewards? Well, yeah, actually maybe I misspoke. I meant a awards. So we were talking a little about some of these things that I could do, you know, uh, parents' choice. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, you know, yeah. Those, yeah, those sort of things. Okay, yeah, awards. Okay, so I have uh, an idea, an opinion on awards. Um, you, pay for, you pay for them. Um, a lot of these awards, if you give them a quality, a quality product, they're going to give you an award. For one thing, they make money by you using their, their little label. So... I went to, um, I think this is the New York Toy Fair. And I went to one of the booths that was there and they had this banner with every single award you could think of for this game. And I said, dude, how'd you do this? How'd you get all these? He's like, it's all about the money. They all want the money of promoting your business. They're marketers, that's what they are. They're not just people that check for quality. They want the best, uh, uh, they want the best connections by showing your, uh, their label on your product. They're getting more advertisements for themselves. They're also setting up like sites where you can go and see the products that they've chosen. And so they're going to get more traffic to their, to their sites. They're trafficking you. But the funny thing is you're not, or they're not paying you to put your, their logo on your game. You're paying them. So you can almost go out and get any one of these awards. Now there's some that have actually have uh, a higher bar um, that it's really hard to get their, their endorsements, especially in game design. But most of the other ones, they want, they want the money. They want you to just do this. But here's the thing. I have found talking to a lot of people that it really doesn't matter what award you have as long as you have an award. If you have one award, if you have two awards, if you have three awards, great. It could be uh, Dr. Toys. It's a big one out there. And I think it's Dr. Something Toys, but um, big logo. That's one that's coveted by a lot of people. They really want that one. But I could have that on my box and pay a lot of money for that logo, that little uh, award. Or I could pay for three different awards, get them all, and pop that on my on my advertisements, on my website, saying, hey, I got all these awards, instead of just that one award. <laughs> yeah. You get basically the same, uh, not authenticity, but 
uh, people think that you're actually a, a good product. Yeah, and I'm not saying, that, yeah, I'm not saying that you should do that to, to trick your customers, <laughs> but if you have a quality product, they're going to give you an award. So <laughs> yeah, to get some mileage out of it at least. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we, uh, we, we had two awards that we got our first year and we still have their logo on there and they they keep coming back and say, Oh yeah. Uh, we'll give you an, another, uh, a more updated logo if you if you pay for it. I'm like, no, nah, it's okay. I mean, I have the 2014. That's all I need. Like, I'm not going out for this, these awards. Look, that, was, that was six years ago. Does that still work? So yeah, it still looks it's, good. Yeah, it hasn't faded or anything. Oh no, <laughs> not faded in its effect. No, and that's and that's the thing because as soon as you get an award, people know that you're legit, and that's what they want to know. They just want to know that you're legit. That when they play your game, they're not just going to get a piece of junk. They have somebody backing it, whether you paid for it or not. They just want to know that there's quality behind it. And that's what basically what the awards are for. They just want to know the quality. Okay, okay. Uh, we have a little bit more time, maybe another five, five minutes or so. And I want to get back into letting you uh, tell people where you're getting your, where to get your games. Cause I'm putting it in, in here, but I want you to talk about that as well. Uh, yeah. How do you feel about talking about straight to the customer for a second for the people who have games? that are trying to okay so from what i understand uh for people who already have games maybe some people who are looking into games like some of my guys in here uh for those you have done something amazing there too you've created sort of a group that uh an informational based group called straight to the customer can you yeah. can you tell us a little bit about that so okay with the coronavirus happening we had to get our our names out a little bit better we had to and this is for the exhibitors of homeschooling groups we had to be able to reach out and, and find these things but a lot of us entrepreneurs a lot of us exhibitors for those that convention those conventions we were basically doing the exact same thing so we were reinventing the wheel so many times so in order to not do that and be able to learn from other people that have already done that whatever process so process one process two process three we created a mastermind where we all come in and talk about things that we have learned so that uh, say we're on a call as a, a mastermind, I can learn from your experience so I don't have to go through it. Or you can learn from my experience so, I don't, or so you don't have to go through it. So getting to a mastermind, especially with game design, is great. Now, there's two things to look for when you go into a mastermind, like, like uh, straight to the customer. You really wanna find out their expertise in it. If they're experts, if everyone's experts, you might be getting to something that you're not ready for. If they're all, um, if there's a mixture of experts and beginners and intermediates, that's a place where you're gonna be able to learn about the beginnings of creating games or creating manufacturing and such. Those experts are gonna be talking about other things that are, look, sound great. They're, they're, it's great information, but you may not be ready for the information that's coming to you. It will be more beneficial to be able to start with people that are in the, the beginning are that are just starting up. So gr joining a mastermind is, is amazing because you're not having to reinvent the wheel. And at the same time, if you're just starting out, it's a great way of learning all this information as long as you have the right people to talk to. So don't get over your head first, go to a mastermind, learn all these things, learn all the, the terminology that I could give you, but I'm not going to give it to you because you, some people would not be able to understand some of the gaming terms that go on. But if you start at the beginning, then you'll be able to find the people that come up. Um, actually, El Elliot, it's because of this convention, I was actually thinking maybe we should start a mastermind for games. So it'd be a great place for people to be able to, to roll around ideas and, and such. And here's the thing also, there are so many ideas out there. You also wanna find a mastermind where you can actually tell your idea and not be worried that's going to be stolen by someone else. Yeah. Most masterminds, you become friends with the other person, the other, the other people in the group, and those people will not try to steal your information. They're just going to try to help you. So you want to find groups that are willing to give and give and give instead of just take and take and take. But at the same time, you better be the same, same type of person. You want to be able to give and give and give. All your experience, just give it away. Give it for free because so much more will come to you. 
Yeah, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. So we're going to go over a little bit and get some of um, Zach's information, his contact information. If you do have a question that we haven't commented on, go ahead and put it down in the uh, webinar chat and we'll get that question up. Uh, also, if you are just getting into the gaming industry, whether you're watching tonight or you're watching this on one of the replays, and you're interested in knowing more maybe about it, uh, about the mastermind or straight to the customer, Zach's gonna give us his information so that you can inundate his uh, box with questions and wonderful information. But uh, Zach, can you tell us a little bit more about how to find your game, how to find maybe some of these, uh, some of the uh, tournaments that you have so people can see it and get interested and, and come to know you a little bit better? Yeah, so our website is uh, history or, or historicalconquest.com. I think Elliot's putting in there. Historicalconquest.com will give you all the information you need to know about uh, the history game. We also branched out to do other games as well. Uh, we have uh, the, uh, let's see, the totally medieval game.com, which is our math game that we came up with as well. Um, what was we that? One. What's that? It's what was that? The, the totally medieval game. Dot com. Yeah, Totally Medieval was taken. That's the name of the game. So we couldn't do that. Totally Medieval Game was taken also. So it's the Totally Medieval Game dot com. Okay. Maybe we should have called it something else, but it was already printed. So hey. <laughs> you, you live and learn. And that was actually my son's game. He was five years old and he came up with the, the concept. And wow. I game played it. Yeah. That was, that was his Christmas present. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so also to get a hold of me um, or to see some of my other stuff, that website that I was talking about, huntthepasts.com. If you want to learn about anything with history, it's going to be there. As of right now, it's starting up. But if you're any type of learner, especially with coronavirus and the virtual learning classes, huntthepasts.com, it gives you basically anything you need um, when it comes to like Albert Einstein, George Washington, the play, it also allows you, we did something different. Now I said it was the most interactive website and that's because you can actually interact with the search engine. It's not just typing in a name. It's typing in a name, going to the era, seeing all the, the topics that we have in the American Revolution or the Greek era, that such. Um, and so that's one way of taking my history game and making it into a learning product is creating another website that helps with doing this. Again, this is a game. If somebody wants to do more, then it's, then it's uh, going to that website. Um, we have a lot of other things out there. Tournaments uh, on our website, historicalconquest.com. There's actually tabs at the top. You can go to our tournaments. There's a tournament tab and you'll be able to see everywhere they're at. But the best way of doing it is going onto the free form that will send an email to me, to my team. And then we'll be able to send that out to the ambassador for east of the Mississippi or west of the Mississippi, and they'll get you in contact with the people that are closest to you. Then again, if you really like histor historical conquest, become an ambassador because you get, uh, I think it's like 35% off every time you purchase. Not, there's no discounts for you because they're already built into the, the marketplace. You can uh, get a discount code where you get a kickback, you get a thank you gift for um, other people using your discount code and they get a discount as well. They get 10%. I think you get 15%. Um, I have to check those numbers. Don't quote me on it. I have to talk to my other people in charge of that. Um, but yeah, that's uh, all other ways of getting hold of me. If you want to talk to me, our general email account, we have two of them. We're actually transitioning to a more legitimate uh, email. Our normal one is historicalconquest at gmail.com. Easiest way to get a hold of us. You can also go to our new one that's general at historicalconquest.com. Um, if you want to get a hold of me, my name is Zach. So it's Zach at historicalconquest.com. Um, yeah, I think that's. Oh, also check us out on Facebook, YouTube. We have like about 400 different videos on historical conquest, going from everything from the how to play the game to uh, critiquing the rules, uh, tutorials on if people have questions on how a card is played. We actually have a group that they all discuss. So if I don't answer your question right away, 
if I don't, if, give it a day. If I don't answer a question, like five other people will answer a question because they're all in there as a community critiquing and asking questions. And anytime there's a card that needs to be adjusted, it's in there as well. We're working on a lot of different things that are coming out, but I have been told that I need to slow down and, uh, and get other people in charge of it. My son's over here. He's actually shaking his head. Uh-huh. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's basically how to get a hold of us. Facebook page gets the, the most information if you want it there. Wow. Man, <clears throat> I want to say thank you so much, Zach. We, we've taken up a whole hour of your time. I appreciate every single minute of it. Uh, everybody, this is Zach Edwards. I'm telling you, this is a brilliant mind. His game is amazing. All of the games are amazing. Even for our young people in the homeschooling, you can see five years old, you can be creating games as well. The games are amazing. Go to the website, Historical Conquest. Go ahead through it. Become an ambassador. There's so much in that. Uh, contact him and ask him some questions about, ask some questions, but go to the Facebook page and ask questions because somebody will definitely get back in touch with you. Thank you so much, Zach, man. I really appreciate you. I know you're a busy man, but uh, this time has been magical, man. I really appreciate it. Elliot, okay, everyone needs to know this. Elliot is an amazing person. If you don't know him personally, he's a great guy to get, in, get to know. And his game is amazing as well because my kids love it. Um, and so reach, if you want anything from me, please reach out. I always answer, uh, individual questions that are sent to, to me. I will actually answer them. Now, if it's about business, it usually goes to somebody else, but if you want, want to ask me a question, it will go to me. I will actually personally, um, present it to you or, uh, respond to your email. So. See, that's an open heart. The man is still giving. I appreciate it. So everyone, thank you so much for attending tonight. Thank you so much to uh, Mr. Zach Edwards, a great man. Uh, we appreciate you. We appreciate all of you coming out to the summit tonight. We will see you tomorrow evening for the last, last, last presentation of the summit. Thank you so much, Zach. You have a wonderful evening. You too. Thanks, Elliot. Thanks, all everyone. Right. Bye, everybody.